welcome Dr. Irene Blea, all the thank way you. from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Indeed, thank you. It's nice to be with you. And thanks for joining Native Voice TV. Now you are very accomplished. You have written books, you've uh, been issued awards, you are tenured as a professor, and you've done it all. You're just busy all the time, I guess, and traveling. I am traveling, but mostly I've just lived a long time. <laughs> if you live long enough, you do a ton of stuff. <laughs> well, I hope so. I hope so, <laughs> but too. But everyone does it, you know, and you have it. Yeah. That's wonderful. You just wrote another book. I did. A little bit about uh, your family, and then we'll talk about your books. Sure, sure. I was born in northern New Mexico on the top and on the back side of a mountain. And um, it, it had to be, the land that I was born on had to be homesteaded before the, after the Americans came to this part of the country. So my great, great grand uncle had property there, quite a bit of it, had lots of sheep. So I grew up rurally, in, on a mountain with tios and tias and cousins and a, a few vecinos. And, and so I grew up communally in that kind of like everybody raised me. And then when I grew up, I turned around and raised other people. So right. uh, then we left the mountain. We went to Pueblo, Colorado, where my father was working in the steel mill. And uh, so I had a real working class um, upbringing after we left the mountain. I entered school about the age of six, Spanish speaking. My grandfather was uh, the last one born on the Taos Pueblo. And uh, he married my Spanish surname grandmother. But we carried some of his ways and his teachings with us, which is why I wrote about wolf medicine. Then I when I I married young at age 19, divorced at age 24, uh, went to college, eventually got to the University of Colorado, got a uh, PhD in sociology, and then got a job as Chicano studies and spent the next 27 years teaching Chicano studies, um, developing course curriculum, and then was recruited away from Colorado to California, where I retired from California State University, Los Angeles, which was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Do they and still have Chicano studies there? They do, they do. Um, there's some controversy as to which was the first and the oldest department in the nation, <laughs> but that department claimed it also. <laughs> and what year was that? I retired, I believe, in 1998, 1998, and I had written textbooks because I was, when I first started teaching, there were no class. We were found, we had to found Chicano studies, and then we had to build curriculum around it. So after I retired, I decided, um, I don't want to footnote, uh, I don't want to reference and generate tables of context and index decks and all of that. So I started writing fictionalized family history. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, I attended a junior college, De Anza in Cupertino, oh, and great. they had they had just started Chicano studies there. Uh -huh. And I was the first graduate from Chicano studies. <laughs> they don't have it anymore. That's why I was asking if they, they still don't. have it. There. We still have some viable programs. We have a fantastic program at the University of New Mexico here in Albuquerque and um, Southern Colorado at the university, let's see, Colorado State University Pueblo in Pueblo, Colorado has a fantastic Chicano Studies Department. Wow. And so there are still some around, some have been incorporated into ethnic studies and uh, it's still a struggle for them. It's it's always been a struggle. Right. Yeah. They did the same thing there. They had changes. They had you know black studies, Chicano studies, and everything was became ethnic studies. So. Right. Watered right. down. We do get watered down in ethnic studies, and 
some of the professors that are still teaching Chicano studies courses are on split appointments. And my rule was never split an appointment because then you're serving two masters. Right. And uh, that just stresses you out <laughs> and it's not good for your health, for your mental health or your physical health. That's true. Yeah. So now you're learning more about your indigenous roots. Well, you know, it, my indigenous roots were very strong in the beginning and then got diluted as I became um, as I became more familiar with mainstream culture and then got a, a mainstream education because that's what public school is. And then I had to reclaim it probably 1975, 1980 or so, and then struggle to get back to where I had started. <laughs> but it came, um, the final solution came when I decided to move back to New Mexico because, you know, we have uh, 19 indigenous pueblos. And um, I left my nuclear family, uh, my brothers, my sisters, my mother, my father in Colorado. And after 35 years of departure from New Mexico, I returned. And it's been a blessing in many ways, mm -hmm. many ways. It was very healing also. I bet it was. You know, a lot of Native people do return to their their homelands after they retire from, because they were put somewhere on relocation, you know. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when they retire, they go back to their homelands or their residence yeah, or wherever. We have to make a living. We have to support uh, the people around us. And so I kind of always knew I was going to return to New Mexico. I just didn't know when. But when I did finally get here, um, I finally found my casita, my adobe home, and uh, mm -hmm. on a quarter acre. And I was able to do all the yard work. But today, it's just challenging to keep up with the yard work. Yeah. So you also wrote poetry. And just tell me a little bit about your other books. Well, I wrote poetry. I started out actually in the, in the movement as a, as a poet, writing books like uh, with the title of um, Damn Sam, I Want to Live My Life, But I Need to Live Alone. So uh, that was part of the feminism that because I kind of had a feminist outlook very young in age. And then um, in the movement, it was, I call it a revenant spirit, you know, it just kind of comes, you know, that dog that runs away and then comes back <laughs> several months later. That was kind of like wolf medicine was for me. And in the Chicano movement, uh, found a very strong voice amongst feminists and um, wrote uh I was sexually molested as a child, and so I have a title called, um, a title chapbook, Manita Memories, which has to do with little hands. And, and if you're from New Mexico, you are either a northern New Mexican, and they call us manitos, and, or a southern New Mexican, and uh, those are suramatos. And those can be demeaning terms, depending on how it is used and who's using it. So I'm a manita and I'm very proud of that. I'm also an erisara in that we are detribalized. Um, we have a detribalized indigenous heritage, which basically means we're not on what people call very popularly the Indian roles. So, um, that in and of itself, I think, colored my life as I moved through it and as I taught and as I taught. Tell me about the book, um, Daughters of the West Mesa. You know, here in New Mexico, in about 2005, a bone was discovered by a dog on the West Mesa. And that led to the discovery of 11 female remains and an unborn fetus found buried in the Mesa. And it very quickly was labeled a serial killing. It's still an unsolved serial killing. 
But uh, Daughters of the West Mesa was written because everywhere I'd go in my community, I would hear people say, well, what about the parents? Where were the parents? These girls wouldn't have gone bad if they had better parents. But I was called in to talk with some of those families. And, and I knew that those parents had struggled. Some of those especially had struggled diligently to get their daughters off the street because the media was posing them as drug addicts and prostitutes. And some were drug addicts, some were prostitutes, some were both. But I didn't like the way it was the whole issue was being discovered. So every time I would meet with the families, one of the one of the fathers brought me in very close to his family. And um, I would go to rallies and dinners and things of that nature. And uh, I, dec I would take notes. I would come home. I've kept a journal since 1979. And I would write these notes in my journal. And then one day I was typing out a poem and I realized I've got a whole bunch of notes here. So I started taking them from my journal onto um, my computer. And before you knew it, I had uh, really an outline for a book. And so all I did was fictionalize the characters, made her a female, raising two daughters alone. One of them's been missing for several months. And the whole mystery is whether or not she's buried out on the mesa. But it, it was horrendous. Every place that Dora, the character in Daughters of the West Mesa goes, I went to including the crime lab and the evidence room and, and the mobile labs. And um, sometimes I was sorry I was there because it was really painful and ugly. Could imagine. And, yeah, but um, I had to do it if I was going to write a book, an honest book. But I did go to every place that Dora goes in the book. I was there. Uh -huh. So, uh, and so... I guess my summary statement for that is I just felt somebody needed to speak for the parents. And uh, that was the birth of Daughters of the West Mesa and it helped keep the issue alive in the community so that we could finally get a park commemorating where the women were found and some benches for people to sit there and meditate. And they have no clue as to what happened or? Oh, well, my book was released on a Wednesday. On a Thursday, across the top half of the local newspaper was a headline that says, um, Blair, primary suspect of West Mesa murders, which totally floored me. Um, in oh. fact, I didn't even know it existed because my cousin called me and she said, Irene, tell me, tell me we're not related to this man. Tell me we're not related. So I got a copy of the paper, looked at it, and this man was accused of um, raping teenage girls and was, in the end, sent uh, to prison for 94 years. And they had some links to the site but they could not uh, prosecute him for it. So then that became very controversial because I'm trying to sell a book, you know? I, I, there's a book I want my community to have. And um, some people suspect I was trying to raise money for this person mm -hmm. whose last name was Blea, by the way. Oh Is my gosh, how could, it? what? A it was beyond circumstance. I, I, to this very day, do not believe that it was circumstantial. Um, the, other, the other part of that is I went to give a presentation when, when, at the Tony Hillerman Conference, which is a Southwest Writers Conference, not the Society of Southwest Writers, but he was a Southwest writer. And I arrived and the host said, Oh, Dr. Blay, I'm so glad you're here. There's a man that's been wanting, waiting and wanting to see you. So I walked over and introduced myself and, and he said, hello, I'm Dr. Um, Detective so-and-so. I've been following you. And he says, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been following you because I, I want a copy of your book. I am sorry, that is, that is, I just did not fall for that. 
but he did buy a copy of the book and I, heaven knows, maybe it's in the, at the crime wow. lab. I don't know. <laughs> well, they probably too, thought it was too much, which it is a coincidence. Too much coincidence for oh, my gosh. book, but you know what? That's just the kind of background. You know, when you grow up in struggle for civil rights, sometimes it, it, it colors your evaluation. I just thought it was too circumstantial for me to, to ignore, I guess is what I want to say. But it was a scary time. My family was afraid for me. I was not afraid because, uh, you know, sometimes in life you just have to do what needs to be done. And that's the way I looked at that. That's amazing. It was amazing. It was an amazing experience. I don't write uh, mysteries or murder mysteries. I write other, uh, other kinds of fiction. And I certainly did not plan to write that. But I had written the trilogy, my Susanna trilogy. And I was at the third book and needed to get that out. But it just kept nagging at me. You know, you hear authors say, this book had to be written. I couldn't not write this. Book. And I didn't believe it. And then that happened to me. Oh, my goodness. Now, oh, is, it was is, quite, is the name was, Blair common in Albuquerque? It is in Albuquerque and no place else. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering. I thought maybe it's a common name. It is in Albuquerque. I had, I think only on one other occasion, I had met a Blaya person. And I come to, when I returned, when I came to Albuquerque, there were like three other Irene Blayas. So um, it is common in the, in the region. Yes. Wow. <laughs> because I haven't heard the name before, but no, you know. Yeah. It's very unusual. It's, it's um, kind of Northern Catalonian with its Spanish origin is Northern Catalonia up around France. So it's a, it's a strange name. Wow. Well, <laughs> I think that's a, that's a weird, gave me chills. Yeah. <laughs> strange. It gives me chills sometimes. Yeah. And you have a page on Facebook and it just has so many followers. Cause I'm on there too. <laughs> that's one of the ways I, I found you. Yes. Um, you. It's, it's really interesting. The type of posts that are on there and the, uh, the information that other Chicanas are sharing with each other. Mm -hmm. Really, and the, really enjoy it. Thank you. And the motivational memes, I really enjoy those. Uh, basically, what I do is I go through my Facebook page and whatever is pertinent to Chicanas, I'll post it, I'll share it, you know. Um, we have over 5,000, we have 5,100 plus women on that. That's a lot of women and a lot of information to share. So I have one fellow that I must block him two or three times a week because he wants to get on that page. And I just argue with everyone, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And who knows what else, you know? So I just, I, I just block them. There are a few men, very few men. Most of them are women. Uh, from all ages, 17 to, I think she told me she was 89 this year. So it's multi-generational. So you'll see that uh, sometimes the page is dedicated to girls and other times to seniors and, oh, and women so nice uh, ages in between. I enjoy it. Thank you for mentioning I do it. enjoy it as well. Thank you. Now, you just came out. You're coming out with another book uh, next month. I, I am. Um, and basically, it goes back to where I started. And this is our new cover. I really like it. My daughter designed the cover because we had, um, when we first designed the cover, when the cover was first designed, they, they had to stretch it out to fit the template. And it just didn't work. So we had to send it back. It should be out by the, before the end of October, for sure, possibly the, uh -huh. the center of next month. So. And the it title has, of the book? Uh, the title is Irene with Wolf Medicine because on the night that I was born, the last wolf that howled in the northern New Mexico mountains howled near where I was born. 
And, and that's because it went on the uh, endangered species list. It had been pretty well hunted to death. And um, it was reintegrated on the year that I returned to New Mexico. And so I grew up with wolf medicine. My, my family, my father especially would talk about it. And, and uh, it was just known that that was my medicine. <laughs> and so I finally had uh, enough years on me to be able to write about it knowledgeably and to inform people about what happened to the wolf and what happened to me in the interim of its departure and then return to the mountains. You had a real connection with the wolf. I do and I have. I, I always have. Um, my mother says she heard the wolf howl and my grandmother, my grandfather and my father would tell me stories about the wolf and what it meant to be born when the wolf howled. Because the wolf is, is a pathfinder and it brings medicine, but not in the, in the sense that some people know medicine like uh, pill taking and ointment. It brings spiritual and psychological medicine. And in that psychological medicine, I was taught that people uh, with wolf spirit are um, highly intellectual, creative, and they're survivalists. They're survivalists. And some of those uh, adjectives fit me. <laughs> and I would and, think so. <laughs> and some I have lived into. And um, when I was, I didn't, I didn't feel um, worthy of writing my autobiography. But I had several people say, you know, you need to write your life story. You really, because, you know, I've traveled pretty much all over the world including the Middle East. And, and I would get comments like, why would a impoverished Manita, because we were highly impoverished in those mountains, grow up to be a university professor and a world traveler if there was something behind it, you know, besides pers perseverance? And I think part of it has to do with um, pathfinding. And it also has to do with struggle and learning to how to live in peace. So I decided finally after some prompting that um, maybe I should do it because there was a Facebook page of Latinas working on PhDs and they were having the kind of problems I had when I was working on my PhD. And it's been 35 years. And, and so finally I thought I'm going to write this book so that those women know one, they're not alone. Two, um, this is how I got through, and maybe it will help you. And three, for my 19-year-old granddaughter, who's who keeps me <laughs> keeps me somewhat informed about technology and cute uh -huh. boys. And cute boys. <laughs> That's what she's of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's it. It's been a good life, and uh, I did learn to live in peace. I had had some counseling, some therapy, and uh, some confrontation of my abuser, and so that's covered. And uh, so does my work, some of my work in the Chicano movement. You were invited to speak at a chola. <laughs> yes, I, I'm really excited about speaking at the chola conference. Uh, it's a whole new. Um, a whole new audience for me. Cholas, I, I've had cholas as uh, students and, and cholas coming in and out of my life individually, but at a conference, I just have to applaud uh, these junior women who, who are, were able to not only conceptualize, but actually hold their second annual Chola conference at the University of Colorado Boulder. And, and uh, sometimes I'm at a loss at what am I going to say, but they told me I could say whatever I wanted to. So I'm going to do that. Um, I like their energy. I like their yes. energy. 
Well, I, I mean, I probably could sit here all day talking to you. <laughs> we'll have to do another show. But I love thank talking you to so you. much for joining us. We're out of time. You're welcome. We'll let you know when we're very good again. <laughs> so, well, all me is that it's been enjoyable, and and allow me you. to congratulate you on your work, and 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 I I will lift you, and hold thank you. you so that you can continue with your good work. Thank you for joining us on Native Voice TV.